Good evening, morning, afternoon, Christmas Beats. This is Reluge, and welcome to a new thing that I would like to uh, do. I've been wanting to do that, do this kind of thing for a little while now. But it's a uh, paranormal review of sorts. Uh, the, the title's been constantly being worked on, but right now it's like paranormal reviews. Uh, it's where I go through, look at investigations and cases of uh, things that people have done. And from just viewing it from like not even the third party, but like I can't describe it. But it's like I, I wasn't there personally, I wasn't there firsthand. I'm just viewing it after everything got shifted through and edited and made to look like what they want me to see. Um so uh coincidentally both John Tron and the Game Grumps did a video about the Haunted Toys R Us in California. And yes, you heard me right, a Toys R Us was haunted in California. Uh, I actually watched the whole, like, a little uh, series that John Tron did. Uh, and this is one of the cases that intrigued me as a kid. But rewatching and rewatching the video, things started to stop making sense of this case. Now, if you did not know, the short story, there was a plantation where Toys R Us is now sitting back in like the 1800s. I twice. Now I love me have a cat. Um. She's been real snuggly because she's in heat. Yes, you are. Aren't you? When you get me this. Um. But. Uh, the, uh, owner of the plantation had some workers. And one of the workers had fallen in love with one of his daughters. A man by the name of John Johnson. Yeah, uh, Danny said it best. Seems like one of the uh, names that your uncle would come up with while telling the story on the spot. Like, oh, uh, Stephen, uh, Stevenson. Yeah, that was my friend's name. He totally saw this one spirit. But anyway, um, But it's like the more I learn about all this other stuff, the more hmm, it becomes quite suspicious. Anyway, uh, the main reason why I wanted to do this, and this is directly after watching Game Grumps uh, video, Sunny Vale's Haunted Toys R Us closed, but it has new life again. Now, this is interesting. When I heard about Toys R Us closing, like, worldwide, my first thought was, what's going to happen to John Johnson? When Sunny Bill's, Sunny Bail, sorry, Toys R Us closed in uh, 2018, didn't just take Baby Schroeder back to figure some coloring books with it. So is this a funny book? I never went to check that part of this. Anyway, it ended the chapter one of the Bay Area's well-known and most enduring ghost stories. The store was built in 1970 as part of Toys R Us' expansion to California. Almost immediately, employees reported strange happenings. Toys would fly off shelves, people felt dancing touches, and faucets turned on and off by themselves. So... I believe that these instances happen. People were uh, legitimately experiencing these kind of things. 
It became legendary among paranormal investigators in the late 70s when it played host to several seances by psychic Sylvia Brown. I'm trying to find something interesting about this person. Aha! Here we go. Sylvia Brown. History of Failure. Psychic Defected. Ooh. Oh, oh, there's only one of five. One difficulty in judging the accuracy of psychics is the vagueness of their readings, which are often so general that they are worthless. True. Psychics who offer readings about missing persons and murder cases, however. About missing persons and murder cases, however, allow researchers to examine their accuracy with independent information. Now, I have seen stories about people actually finding bodies of people. Like psychically. So I believe, I personally believe it can happen. But please, if you are a fraud psychic, don't work with the police. You just, A, make psychics look bad because you're actually getting into the limelight with a murder case, B, screwing over an actual investigation, and C, I don't know, let's see, it's just don't do it. So anyway. When Sylvia Brown was a weekly guest on the Montreal Williams show, weekly, she performed supposed feats ranging from ghost detecting to offering details about missing persons and murder cases on a weekly basis. Hey you. That's what I thought. I just realized you can see crutches in the background. Oh well, you can see crutches in the background. I'm human. So is my wife. Because my wife had to use that lately. Anyway. Among the things Brown failed to predict was the availability of those transcripts on the internet through databases such as LexisNexis. The authors, as well as several members of the James Randi Educational Foundation Forum and StopSylvia.com closely examine each transcript to track Brown's actors. According to Brown, many my accuracy rate is somewhere between 87 and 90 percent, if I'm recalling correctly. Oh, it's about my. Uh, uh, how close can I, to 100 can I get without looking like a fraud? Uh, 95%. By the way, 75% of, uh, um, ratings are made up on the spot. Wow, my brain power is awful. This article disputes that. St oh, statistics. Okay, let me say that again. 75% of statistics are made up on the spot. The article disputes that statistics by examining the criminal cases for which Brown has performed readings, the research demonstrates that in 115 cases, all of the available, all of the available readings, Brown's con Formality accuracy was 0%, just like my reading capability. This article is structured in terms of known and unknown outcomes. The criteria for a correct prediction is that it is mostly matches a case referenced in the newspaper, and the criteria for a wrong prediction is that Brown's claim 
is the opposite of what actually occurred. The metric for the final accuracy counts is based on what is correct compared to the unknown or wrong claim. As this article shows, in the 115 available cases, Brown was correct zero times and wrong 25 times. 90 out of the 115 cases have unknown outcomes. This is why you do not go into cases like like actual police investigations if you're a fraud to try to help them solve the damn case. What you're working on is bigger than you. Okay? And they even know people stop at psychics. When you're involving like a missing person, you're hopeful that the psychic is actually correct. And then uh, you can ask any officer if like any information that they get, are they hopeful that it's the right information? It doesn't matter if it's psychic or not. Now here's the part that uh, I'm interested in. The case of Sylvia Brown, what's wrong about? Erica Baker, November 19, 2003. And as a disclaimer, all of these people, I give my heart and soul to. Because not only did something awful happen to them, but the false information given by this fraud did not help matters. Brown told Erica's mother she's not dead, but in Michigan, ow, ow. Furthermore, Brown claimed someone sold her for drugs, and there was a black woman who helped throw her in an old trunk. In 2005, Christian John Gabriel was convicted of moving and concealing Erica's body in Kettering, Ohio. Her body was not found, but Gabriel claimed to have buried it after hitting her with his van. Ooh, that is painful. Jamie Barker in February 2001 on Montel, two months after Barker fell from a bridge while working, Brown told his widow he died quick and his body is on the site, there's no doubt about it. But they won't find it unless they dig, and I don't think they will. Two months later, Barker's body was discovered downstream in La Salle. An autopsy discovered he suffered no broken bones or head injuries in the 15-story fall, but instead drowned. Drowning is not instant and painful. Now, in this case, I feel that she was trying to bring peace to a grieving widow, which I, I kind of, I'm not upset about this, because she was trying to calm her down. He died painlessly. It was quick. <coughs> Eve Brown, September 30th, 1999. Brown told the family, oh wow, Brown A, Brown A, um, anyway, that E. Brown is well and living in Florida. This is not true, as E.'s body was found a year later at a Brooklyn, New York construction site 13 miles from where she was last seen. The murder remains unsolved. Yeah, she's fine, she's living in Florida, she's just living in a going on uh, uh, Miami. Welcome to Miami. <sighs> Terrence Farrell. Brown told the woman that Farrell, a firefighter involved in 9-11, was alive. She was wrong. His body was found in the rubble one month later. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to stop there because there's a lot. I'm going to leave it on screen for a minute. You can pause it. Read all this if you want. My point is, Sylvia 
brown egg is raw. One of those answers was shown on a popular program that's incredible, launching the store to international fame. And the episode, which features a number of delightfully terrible reenactments, Brownie tells the story of the so-called Toys R Us ghost. According to Brownie, she was able to make contact with the ghost, of course, a laborer on the farm that once stood on the spot of the new store. As he walked down the hall toward me, he kept saying, Have mercy on me, Beth. Brownie related. She also claimed she intuited the ghost's name, Johnny Johnson. And a suitably cinematic backstroke. Johnson, a traveling preacher from. Oh, okay. I said most of this. Oh, yeah. I forgot the part where, uh, after she turned him down and ran away with a lawyer, he was chopping wood and the axe slipped, hitting him in the leg. Some stories say that he died instantly. Other stories say he slowly bled to death. So, it's like he cut himself in the leg. And wasn't able to drag himself to the plantation or yell or scream or have or someone find him. I'm pretty sure someone would have been around because there would have been multiple workers. Um, how long is this one? Six minutes. This ghost is casting a shadow. Gonna have to put some headphones in. I don't know why my speakers are crap. Or oh, SF gate. call bullshit on that. Ghosts not knowing that they're dead. The only time that I feel like they don't know that they died is when they die in like their sleep and they wake up and their body's not there and they just walk around acting like everything's all normal. Or if uh, something sudden happened, like you're walking across the street, car hits you, and let's just say that the person doesn't feel like leaving their body, they like die instantly and they just, the spirit just keeps walking. Then, maybe. But, ow, my leg is uh, cut. I'm bleeding out. Oh, I'm feeling sleepy. Oh, I'm not dead. I, I call bullshit.
Are they automated? Johnny, uh, I mean Yanni, because that's how I decide to uh, pronounce things now. Anyway. I just caught a contradiction there. Did you guys catch it? You said on the right side is the spirit on the uh, photo. And yeah, those are seventies clothes. I wonder if I brighten this in Photoshop. Because it's dark. You can see! Head. Shoulders. The rest you can barely make out. I'm definitely going to take this into Photoshop, line it up, put it right next to here in my video so you can see what I'm talking about. I don't know if it's going to be any good at this point, but I'll do a little commentary down at the bottom. Hi, Markiplier. All right, so a look back at primary sources reveals scant evidence for any of it. So here's the thing. The glorious of the internet. We can look this up now. Being a kid and watching this on TV, it's like, oh, this is cool. I want to go visit that toy store now. This is so fascinating. And now you can look it up and be like, huh. For starters, the dates are all wrong. Elizabeth had been dead for years by the time the story takes place. She died at the age of 30 in 1875. She also didn't run away with the East Coast of Warrior. She was married in grand fashion to William Taft, the son of a wealthy dry goods merchant from San Francisco in 1836. And you know what? Taft sounds really familiar. 
the society even joined it to the young state's most prominent families. They also gave the legend the benefit of the doubt and looked into the lives of Elizabeth's children for a suitable substitute. She had twin girls named Molly and Maddie, but neither ever married. Let's recall California census data from 1620 or 1860 to 90 turns up a number of farm laborers born in Sweden who were living in the Sunnyvale area, but none meet the right specs for Brown's John Johnson. Similarly, searches through California newspapers find no account of a grisly death on the Murphy property, despite many internet retellings of the tale claiming the old news clippings mention Johnson. So, uh, what was, uh, Sunnyvale, California. Sunnyvale, California, Jan Johnson. Okay, uh. Sunnyvale, California, John Johnson. Okay, so here's the thing. A quick search of those put together. I can, the only time I can uh, find a John Johnson at Sunnyvale, or Sunnyvale, is it involving the Toy Story, or Toy Story story. Not saying that it's the records don't exist, but I can't find it. Finally, there's that pesky Beth detail. According to family records and obituaries, Elizabeth went by Lizzie, not Beth. Jan Janssen aside, the Murphys were one of early California's most fascinating families and the subject of enough drama without invented ghost stories. Martin and Mary Murphy, a married couple, go away, were in the first wagon train to cross the Sierra Nevadas, blazing the trail that would soon be known as Donner Pass. During the winter of 1844, Mary gave birth to Elizabeth, who was famous throughout her life for the first pioneer child born in California. Several weeks later, baby Lizzie fell into the Yabba River. Luckily, her father was able to fish her out. Far after, her middle name was Yabba. Once settled in the Bay Area, Murphy bought the Spanish land grant known as 
Rancho Pastoria de Las Boris in present-day Sunnyvale. There, they built the area's first wood frame house, Bayview Ranch, and planted the first orchards. Before long, the Murphys were rich and influential, hosting political and social events at their ranch, and helping establish both Notre Dame College in San Jose and the University of Santa Clara. Ooh! When Elizabeth married, the Murphys gifted her and her new husband, William Taft, 3,000 acres. Today, all of Los Altos Hills as a wedding present. Elizabeth Way and Taft Avenue in Sunnyvale and Elizabeth Avenue in Los Altos are named after them. That is so fascinating! I personally, I'd rather hear a uh, retelling of this story. 19, in 1881, the Murphys famously held their 5th, 5th, and wedding anniversary gala on the ranch. 6,000 guests allegedly showed up, making it the largest pal party in California history up until that point. San Francisco Cal said that they were fed it in truly regal style. Okay, so here is the thing. Oh yeah, oh yeah, the thing that, uh, Uh, Hoffman died on the property in 1894 when he was working on a pump in the farm well. Unfortunately for Hoffman, the well was next to a leaking gas tank. After he failed to show up for dinner, he was found dead at the bottom of the well, asphyxiated from gas fumes. Martin went down to retrieve the body. He unwisely lit a candle to guide it away. The call reported he was... Blown out of the well by the explosion. Martin was badly burned, but he survived. I could just imagine this. Huh, it's dark down here. I smell gas. Well, better I can handle we'll see where the gas is. Okay, so... Recently, Spirit... A, the Spirit Halloween store has taken residence in the Toys R Us uh, uh, building, which is fantastic. Uh, but uh, if people are saying that the ghost is not going to be there anymore because the Toys R Us isn't, the building isn't a Toys R Us, they're forgetting at the time the person died, there was no building built there. There was a plantation there. If that's the case, the ghost would still no longer be there because his plantation is uh, demolished. He's not there because of the building, because it's familiar. He's there because that's where he died. Now, everybody's like, oh, it's, uh, it's sad that Betty uh, uh, turned down his love. But no, it's not. Here's the thing. She apparently had another love that she was in with. Now, she probably was doing it because it was two major families uh, farming. Yes, that's probably it. She also probably didn't think that uh, being in love with the uh, plant station's help was... Uh, oh, I had the word. She probably thought that was below her. Which... People often do, especially people that are in a rich situation. But before you all, like, start haters, like, oh, she should have fallen in love with him, he loved her. That's not how things work. It's, I mean, it, it would be nice if every single girl, wait, no, it's not, because the girl is uh, her own person. If she fell in love with him and ran off with him, awesome. If she ran off with another person, awesome. 
Yeah, it's just... I was on that side, by the way, just to let you know. It's like, oh, I like you. You should give me a chance. Then I grew up. And I've learned it's... No, no, the other girls shouldn't give me a chance. I mean, it's okay for me to express my uh, fondness of a girl. But if she's not fond of me, then it's not really her loss. It's more of my loss. But she, uh, it's her choice. It's like, oh crap, this guy likes me. I have to like him back now. So anyway, so, uh, that looks like that's it of that. Uh, so the psychic that claims to have found this information by talking to the ghost it seems that she had a little detail, like she might have already known what was there. As a good paranormal investigator should know. You, unless you're a real psychic, you don't just walk up onto a place and be like, okay, let's investigate this ghost. I'm going to have to go investigate things now. You do a little research beforehand. You look at the place, you look at the information, you see what there is to see. And, uh, there's a little bit of evidence that a John was working at the plantation, but it does not seem like the story that she told it was completely true. And, of course, it's a love interest that's causing them to stay. Of course it is. That's, that just strikes people's hearts like, Aw, he loved the girl, but she didn't love him back. How sad. And then he tragically died while he's frustrated about his love. And now he's looking for her. Aw, that's so sad and sweet. So... How I feel, my final uh, thoughts on this, I feel that there probably is something haunting that area. Uh, all the reenactments of all these uh, events are kind of silly. Uh, like that one video when they go into the toy the uh, storage area and everything's moving and things are flying all over the place. <sighs> what they don't tell you is that uh, the uh, manager that went back there saw nothing. Yeah, I've, I've since looked it up because I was trying to find the videos because we had it recorded on uh, eight on the uh, yeah eight track. Which, uh, no, beta. It was beta. Which, uh, you can barely find any beta recorder, beta players anymore. So I can't watch those, so I was trying to find them online. I found interesting tidbits of every single case. So. I don't think it's John Johnson that's haunting the area. I think it's a different spirit. And, uh, I don't, I don't think that spirits are stuck in the place because they either think that they don't know if they died or if they're looking for something or if something is unfinished. I feel that, in fact, I can't give you an explanation. Personally, for myself, when I pass away... And you're able to be a ghost? I'm going to haunt the fuck out of people. <laughs> In fact, it would be interesting. Very interesting if, like, as a ghost, if you can manipulate things and uh, actually hurt people. Why not use that power for good? Like, 
there's a, a woman walking down the street and she gets uh, um, assaulted by people, by guys, by girls, does not matter. She gets assaulted for robbery, rape, whatever it is. And it's like as a ghost, and I can manipulate things, and I can, like, say, push people into walls, or, or like, really fuck them up. Why not save the girl? Like, why not? If you have the power and the means, and you're there, do it. Ghost or not, save the girl. I also scare the shit out of random people. So anyway, that's my thoughts on this. Uh, whenever I do, I like talk about cases like this where it involves living people, dead people, people that still have family. Please be respectful in the comment section down below. Also, be respectful to commenters in the comment section down below. Also, I'm not doing this because, ooh, I'm going to jump on the, uh, uh, coattails of a couple other, uh, YouTubers and ride it. Like, cold style fashion. This is a thing that's been on my mind for years. And watching John Tron and Green Grumps makes me realize it's like, hey, I've had a thing to say about this for a while now. So, here we are. I plan on doing more of these kind of things. <sighs> One I gotta tread lightly, and this is one I actually kind of want to reach out to one of the uh, people of the case. But I want to be full of tack. Trying to figure out how to phrase that properly without sounding like I'm tactless. But uh, I want to be professional, and I want to approach this. And not offend the person because the thing I want to, uh, the thing I want to, uh, investigate is, wow, I can't explain it. I don't want to say anything of the details because I don't want to upset her, but I feel it needs to be said and looked at from a different party. So, uh, just let me know what you think of this video. Be considerate in the comment sections, and until next time. Stay white and nerdy.